Well, I'm going to prove how easily I can get distracted this morning. I forgot to put the current sermon in my folder. <laughs> so if you'll excuse me for a minute, I will get the right one. I should be telling you my joke or something now. Oh, well. Anyway. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, and open us more fully to your love and to your grace. It's almost a uh, matter of humor to me that the Sunday after Easter, the gospel story is always the story about Thomas, every year. You know, there's a three-year cycle of readings, but every year, it's the gospel of, it's the gospel from John, 20 about Thomas, and every year Alex goes on vacation this Sunday. Now, I spent 30 some years preaching most Sundays after Easter, so I do have a rotating set of themes to discuss that are related to this gospel text. And today I want to draw on one of those that maybe doesn't seem immediately related to it, but it is. In fact, it's related to all of the post-resurrection stories. You know, there's more than just this one or the story from John that we read last week on Easter about Peter and John and Mary Magdalene at the tomb. There are several others that are both in John and in Luke and in Matthew. And all of them, in all of them, the people who are in those stories, the, the disciples that are in them, are faced with a situation in which they don't quite know what to make of what's going on. If you think about last week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, she sees it's rolled away, she runs and she gets Peter and, and John, and they come and they get in and they look, but, uh, well, actually it says right in John, they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So the disciples went back to where they were staying. And then Mary Magdalene, who lingers and is crying and, and weeping and thinks that Jesus is the gardener, and wants to know where he took the body, or if he took the body, it isn't until he speaks her name that she recognizes that it's Jesus. And then she right, runs back to say that, that we've seen Jesus, that I've seen Jesus, and he's alive, but the disciples still stay locked in a room. Now, he does appear to them later, and he appears in spite of the locked door. And, they, and the first part of the story that we heard today occurs. But at the same time, Luke says, or around the same time, Luke writes that there were some two disciples who had been in Jerusalem who'd heard the initial news that Jesus was alive, but who really didn't grasp it. They, you know, and so they decided to go home. And they're walking on the road to Emmaus. And they encounter this person walking on the road and that he joins with them and they're really downcast and, and he, he says, well, why are you so downcast? And they go, 
haven't you heard what happened in Jerusalem and oh, all this stuff? And, and they, he starts explaining it to them. And even at that moment, they don't realize who he is. It's until they get it to some place and it's about the end of the day and they're going to stop and have supper and they say, why don't you stay with us? And at the table, when Jesus breaks the bread, they recognize him. And then they go, oh yeah, when he was talking to us, didn't our hearts burn like, wow, this was important? Then they run back, to head back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples what they had seen. And then there's a scene also recorded in John after the lessons from today in the next chapter where a group of the disciples have headed back up to Galilee and they're by the Sea of Galilee and Peter says, I'm going fishing. And this is kind of like a redo of the story of the call of the disciples because some others go with them and they don't have much luck. But then this person appears on the shore and says, put your nets down over there. And they do. And they catch all these fish. And Peter goes, oh my gosh, that's Jesus. And he jumps out of the boat and races ashore. And then they have a sort of a picnic on the beach with fish. And then Jesus and Peter have a little private walk and talk where Jesus repeatedly asks Peter three times, to go with the three times apparently that he denied Jesus, that, uh, do you love me? And Peter says yes, and Jesus says, well then, take, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. He gives them a future. You're not just to stay here and go back to being a fisherman, you've got a future. In the weeks between Easter and Pentecost, we get a lot of those stories. We see the disciples trying to figure out just, once they get convinced, okay, he's alive, just where is this going to go? And they find out more fully come Pentecost. But we, like those disciples, we just celebrated Easter last week. Now, how many of you went home, and this includes me, because I went home thinking, oh good, I get to eat chocolate today. <laughs> well, that was one of the things I went home thinking, because I gave it up for Lent, and I was ready for chocolate. Uh, some of you can appreciate that. Um, and, but how many of us went home and thought, well, now that we've celebrate the, celebrated the risen Lord. That's the what. What about the what next? What are we called to do in response? What's next? Because that's what the disciples were experiencing during these weeks leading up to Pentecost. What's next? Where is this all going? Where is it taking us? What are we called to do? They were, in other words, in the process of discernment. Big word. But we all discern things every day in little ways. You know, every day I get up and look at all the emails I have in my inbox. I have had the same personal, I've had different work emails over the years, but I've had the same personal email since it was dial-up. Now that mean, consequently means everybody on earth, almost, it seems, has my email address. And I will wake up in the morning and check my email, you know, the first time I check it, oh, you've got 89 new emails. And I have to go through and sort out, in other words, discern which ones I should just trash. And which ones are important that I should pay attention to. 
Life is full of little discernment things like that. You all have them in your lives. Mm, you're going to go shopping. What should I have on my list this week for groceries? That's a little discernment task. But spiritual discernment is a bigger task. And that's what I'm talking about today. I'm sure you're all capable of making your grocery list. And I'm pretty capable of recognizing, by experience, which emails are not worth opening or which ones are dangerous to open. But when we're talking about the, the discernment of deeper questions, such as the disciples were making and, and dealing with and which we are called to deal with, we are really looking at how in our lives we find a spiritual vision, a direction from the things that we have come to learn through our faith. Some of the other things that I, I found in looking at different definitions of discernment and some other sources that uh, one of the definitions was simply the ability to assess, assess correctly, to recognize what's true and, not, and what's not true, to see the reality of our current situation, what's really going on. That's kind of what the disciples were looking at on Easter morning, what is really going on here? Did somebody steal the body? Did he rise? I mean, what does it all mean? And to consider the effects of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. What will the be effects of our behaviors be in light of what we know to be true? How should we behave? to distinguish between and recognize the moral implications of different courses of actions. When you're deciding about how you're going to behave in a situation, whether it's a little thing or a big decision, how are we considering the implications, the moral implications of those decisions? Being discerning also helps us protect us from being vulnerable to the temptations that are around us because it enables us to recognize what's basically a trap. And we need to be discerning about ourselves to know our own vulnerabilities. As it said in the epistle today, if we say that we never sin or even never are tempted, we're kidding ourselves <laughs> because we still are vulnerable to temptation. And the better we are at discerning how we should respond to various situations, the more likely it is that we are to avoid doing things that will be destructive to ourselves, to other people, and our world. Now, being discerning, and one of the things it said in, in one of the, the discussions I read, it says, do not confuse being discerning with being judgmental. When we are being discerning, we are seeking truth for ourselves and our directions and our purposes. It is not a means of pointing fingers at others. Oh, I discern that that person is bad or you know, that one over there, oh, they're really messed up. No, it's not the same as being judgmental. Discerning is making judgments if you're going to use that word, about what is right for you in the context of your understanding of your faith and your relationship with God. It's not a call to judge. You know, Jesus encountered many people, and I could list a lot of them, but I'll just mention a few, that he discerned had serious problems, some physical, some spiritual. And uh, he did not judge them and dismiss them and say, get that person away from me. Here's a couple of examples. You remember that Gerasene demoniac, the one that was just a wild man living among the tombs? When Jesus encountered him, I mean, the people kept trying to chain him up. They didn't want anything to do with him. He didn't look at that person and say, get him away from me. He perceived someone who was 
in the, the parlance and the understanding of the day that he was possessed by devils that were tormenting them. So what did he do? He drove out the devils and turned the man into a man who could live a happy life and who could witness to the goodness of God. There's a couple of tax connectors collectors that Jesus encountered. You know, that was Matthew's job before he became an apostle. But Jesus didn't see in him someone who was a cheat and a Roman collaborator. He saw someone who could be his disciple and called him to that. And then you remember Zacchaeus up in the tree. He also was a tax collector. And Jesus went to his house, and he was somebody, you know, people were kind of shocked because he's hanging out with another tax collector. Those people work for Rome. They steal our money from us by overcharging on the taxes. What is going on? But after Jesus spent time with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus came out a changed person who paid back everybody he'd stolen from double. Or remember the woman at the well who had had all those husbands that weren't her husbands. First of all, she was a Samaritan. Jews don't, didn't hang out with Samaritans or talk to them. Secondly, she was a woman by herself. Jewish men would never talk to that, to one of them. But Jesus did, and he saw her as a woman who was seeking for something, who maybe was in pain. And what he said to her changed her life forever. So discernment, when we apply it to someone else, is not to judge them, but to see how we can bring grace to them. Discernment helps us, as I've said, recognize true from false. It also helps us recognize what is what are the primary import things that are primary of primary importance versus those that are secondary? Nice, but not really necessary. The essential from the optional. It helps us recognize that which is eternal, permanent, versus what's temporary, what's here today and gone tomorrow. It's a gift that helps us develop wisdom, a sense of reality. It brings us insight, spiritual awareness, and spiritual maturity. Now, on the gift of Pentecost, which we'll be celebrating in a few weeks, the disciples found all the pieces coming together in some ways. They still had some things to learn, but they got the big picture when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course, among the gifts that they received were the gifts of discernment. But where we stand and sit with them today on their journey is it hasn't happened yet. They're still anticipating. Well, we have a little advantage over them. They had some advantages over us in their journey. They got to see Jesus physically present with them after the resurrection before he ascended into heaven. We come into the stories already knowing what's happened. So as we go through Lent, I mean, this might not actually be an advantage because we know that Easter comes after Good Friday. Remember when Pastor Alex preached about Good Friday and It's Friday, but Sunday's coming, Easter's coming. We can kind of want to, because we know Easter's coming, we kind of want to sometimes downplay some of the events of Holy Week that are not so pleasant to contemplate, to put it mildly. But at the same time, we do not have to wait for Pentecost. Because Pentecost, folks, happened, oh, 3,000 roughly years, or 2,000 years ago. It's happened. 
we're going to celebrate it in a special way, just like we celebrated Easter and the resurrection in a special way last week. But the reality is, just as I was telling the kids, the, children, the young people, that Jesus is risen and present with us every day, the Holy Spirit came upon the church and is present with us every day. We can tap into discernment in our lives in a big way. We can do it through study and prayer, contemplation. Now, I think of contemplation as being a thoughtful and prayerful focus on a particular situation or issue. And then there's meditation, which is, I understand, to be sort of an emptying of a busy mind in order to listen more closely to God. And through consultation with others who share our faith, spiritual advisors. You know, in the Catholic Church, there, there's a tradition of having, for some people, of having a spiritual advisor with which they talk about their life and get feedback periodically. When I, during my years in the Quaker church, while I was making some big decisions, I met with a clearness committee, which is basically a group of people that you ask to participate, to meet with you, to hear what you're thinking about, and give you feedback. It's a discernment process. You may have read in the newsletter, if you read it, uh, and you may be aware of this for other reasons, that Pastor Alex will be forming a discernment committee in the church here as he pursues moving from being a licensed minister to ordination. This church is also, as a body, through its uh, leadership and futuring committee that exists, as a body seeking discernment. Let us, as a people, individually in our lives, for other people like Alex as he goes through this process of working towards his ordination, as a congregation, pray that God will make us a discerning people and a discerning church. Not a busy church necessarily, at least not busy with all the things that really aren't the most important things, but a church that can perceive what are the truly important things. And believe me, if we identify those, we will be busy enough and have much to praise God for. Amen.